Well, it's good to be here as always, right? Amen. Excited to study God's Word here this morning, and I think we're going to get right into it now. So I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word here this morning. Matthew chapter 15, verses 29 through 31. And Jesus departed from thence, and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee, and went up into a mountain, and sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see. And they glorified the God of Israel. And Lord Jesus, we thank you now this morning for your word. We pray that we would glorify you now also as we study your word, as we learn of you, as we grow in you. So help us today, teach us today, change us today. And of course, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, praise God. Well, we've been studying the last few weeks, the beginning of this six-month period between the end of John 6 and John chapter 7, verse 2. At this point, we're within a year of the death of our Lord as we continue on this journey of his life together. And this six-month period between, again, the end of John 6 and really the beginning of John 7, much of it is spent outside the land of Israel. We may not think too often about Jesus ministering outside of Israel, but he does at times especially during this time. And the main reason for that, of course, as we've already seen, is that he's trying to get alone. He's trying to have some quality time with his disciples to prepare them for what is coming next, to prepare them for his death and for their ministry. And we're going to see that especially in the weeks to come. Up until now, Jesus has not yet mentioned that he's going to be going to Jerusalem to die. Very soon he will start to say that to them. And as you read these gospel accounts, it really appears that he says that to them as much as he possibly can. And yet they, of course, never fully or even at all seem to grasp what he's saying. And so he spends this time trying to get alone, trying to minister and prepare his disciples. And yet, wherever he goes, the crowds are sure to follow. Wherever Jesus goes, the crowds always follow, as we see once again here today. Now, a few weeks back, we spent a couple weeks in verses 1 through 20 of Matthew 15, and really it was a wonderful lesson on the depths of man's depravity. And as Jesus says, the fact that it's out of the heart that proceeds evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and fornications and every other kind of sin. It's not the outward things that you can change. It's the inward things you have no hope to change that defile the man. Out of our heart proceeds all manner of evil and wickedness. Out of every human heart proceeds all manner of evil and wickedness apart from the grace and mercy of our God. And so a wonderful lesson on the depths of man's depravity, which led very nicely into what we saw last week. This really remarkable miracle story where Jesus finally, and really after needing some convincing it almost seems, he heals this woman's daughter, this woman, of course, who had a daughter grievously vexed with a demon, we're told, in verses 21 through 28, and really after trying to get away from her initially, 
Jesus finally does what she asks, and we've said we don't know if that's out of just his humanity, if he really did not want to deal with her honestly that much, or if it was in his deity he was just testing her, we really don't know. We know God is good, and we know God is just, and we know this woman showed remarkable faith, remarkable perseverance, and remarkable humility. Because remember, Jesus says to her in verse 26, it's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. What he's saying is that you are unworthy of what you are asking. You don't deserve what you're asking. And she, in verse 27, says, truth, Lord. Yes, Lord. I agree with you. I am unworthy of what I am asking but I ask it anyway, appealing to your mercy and to your grace. And I ask not for the whole loaf of bread, but just for a few crumbs of the bread. And Jesus marveled at her faith. Great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. A remarkable, remarkable story. And of course, a great lesson there for us, which we all need to learn. We all need to make no mistake about this. That we understand we are unworthy of heaven's mercies. None are worthy of God's grace. None are worthy of anything ever from the Lord. Anything we have is mercy from God that we are not worthy of. And as we've said many times here, any moment that any man, woman, or child spends not in hell is mercy from God. Because that is what we all deserve every moment of every day. And yet in the mercy and grace of God, he offers salvation. He offers healing. He offers grace. Though we are unworthy, he is worthy. And he is good, and he is kind, and he is merciful, and he is just. And we praise him for that. So may we never forget that we too are unworthy of heaven's mercies. May we be like this woman of Canaan, agreeing with our Lord, agreeing with our own unworthiness. May we never think ourselves an exception. There are no exceptions to this rule. May we never think that we deserve anything from our God. And yet, may we then praise Him and worship Him all the more, given that He's constantly giving us that which we do not deserve every single day. And so praise God for that. Well, that's where we've been the past several weeks. Now we're going to look at the next few verses, and then we're going to look at Mark 7 for a bit here today. But Matthew 15 now, beginning in verse 29, so Jesus is still outside of the land. The people are still coming. The miracles are still happening, praise God. And we read that Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. We're going to see as we get to Mark 7 that really Jesus doesn't go right back to Galilee, that he's going around, and even this passage here tells us he's dealing with Gentile people. He's dealing with people outside of the land of Israel. That's why they glorify the God of Israel in verse 31, because it's not their God. They're outside of the land right now. Jesus is outside of the land at this point, these miracles that are taking place here. And so he went up, he went back to Galilee eventually, up into a mountain, sat down there, and great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others. And so though Jesus is outside the land trying to get alone, trying to spend time with his disciples, as we know, the multitudes continue to come and they continue to bring their lame, their blind, their dumb, and so on and so forth. Many others were told. And when we read that, and we've read these kinds of things many times already, in our Lord's life, when we read that, we think to ourselves, what a mess sin has made of this world. 
What a mess sin has made of this world. Because when we look around, when we see lame and maimed and blind and dumb or anything else, when we see sickness and disease, when we see sorrow and heartache and guilt and shame and fear and torture and all, anything bad you can think of, it's all because of sin. It's all because of sin. And it may not be because of that specific person's sin who's dealing with that issue, but it is because of sin in this world. And so you think to yourself, what a mess sin has made of this world. The fact that these people exist. The fact that sorrow and heartache exist. The fact that all sorts of evil, every manner of evil and iniquity and injustice exists. What a mess sin has made of this world. And even at its best, sorrow is never very far away. Even when things seem like they're going well in the world, that's a very, very short time where that will continue. Sin and evil and sorrow is never far away. So they bring to Jesus all sorts of people with all sorts of problems because of sin in this world, and they cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. But I love that little statement there, they cast them down at Jesus' feet, because sometimes this is all we can do, and sometimes this is all we should do. We take what sin has caused, what our sin sometimes causes, what someone else's sin might cause in our lives, whatever the case is, we take what sin has caused, the pain, the evil, the heartache, the struggle, the trial, the suffering, the fear, the guilt, the anguish, whatever it is, we take what sin has caused and we cast it down at Jesus' feet. That is what we can do as God's children. That is what we should be doing as God's children. Casting it down at Jesus' feet. Thank God that we can. Praise God for that. Peter tells us, casting all your care upon the Lord, for he careth for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. David says in the Psalms, Psalm 30, verse 8, I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. Psalm 142, verse 2, I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. I just brought my trouble to him. Like Peter says, I cast my care upon him. That is what we can do. That is what we need to do. And so I love that right here. They cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Again, what a mighty, loving, compassionate Lord we have. Though never deserved, though all are unworthy, mercy and grace is readily available. So they cast them at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. He healed them. Though he's trying to be alone, though he really wants to get away from people, they bring him their problems. They bring him their sick, and their infirmed, and their dying, and he heals them anyway. Because salvation is not just of the Lord. The Lord is salvation. Jesus is not just able to save. He's willing to save. He's not just able to heal. He's willing to heal. Praise God for the compassionate, loving Lord we have. And in verse 31, insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. They glorified the God of Israel, because again, these were non-Israelites. These were Gentile, pagan people, as we'll see again more clearly in Mark. So they glorify the God of Israel. This is not their God, but they realize that this God is far more powerful than their false and phony gods. They see the real difference between the God of Israel, who Jesus, of course, is, and Jesus proclaims, and their false and phony pagan gods. We don't know how many would turn to Jesus 
in saving faith. We certainly cannot say. Odds are that most did not. Odds are that most did not, as we've seen already. And yet, they glorify the God of Israel. They recognize that this is real power. That this is something deserving of glory. And so multitudes come, and multitudes are healed. And that's all Matthew really says about it. He just kind of summarizes for us this exact moment in our Lord's life during this six-month period, this moment of it as he's making his way back to the land, going the long way about, as we'll see. Multitudes continue to come. Multitudes continue to be healed. It's truly, truly wonderful. And one of these healings, and there were many, clearly. Many were healed. Lame, blind, dumb, maimed. Many. And yet one of them is now expounded for us in greater detail in Mark's Gospel. And so I encourage you to take your Bible and I'll flip over to Mark chapter 7, where we'll spend the rest of our time here this morning. Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 37, we have one example of one of these great miracles that our Lord has done at this exact time period. And it's an incredible miracle. It's a remarkable miracle. There may be some oddities about this miracle, as we will see. But nevertheless, we praise our Lord for it. We glorify the God of Israel for it, the God of the Bible for it, the one true God for it. So let's see what Mark has to tell us now. One example of one of these miracles that we just read in Matthew. And so Mark 7, beginning now in verse 31, and again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, because remember, that's where Jesus had just been, outside of the land, Tyre and Sidon, pagan cities, pagan regions. Yet even there, people knew who he was. Everyone knew who Jesus was, the great miracle worker. Everybody wanted a piece of Jesus. Sadly, most did not want the message of Jesus, but they wanted a bit of Jesus. So he departs from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, and he came unto the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. Now, if you had a map in front of you, you could see this better. But just follow along briefly. Tyre and Sidon are north of Galilee. They're north and even slightly west of Galilee, of Israel. So when he departs Tyre and Sidon, as he heads back to the Sea of Galilee, as he heads back into the land, he does not take the direct route, which would be just straight south. Instead, he circles all the way around. Again, staying outside of the land, going back to the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the Decapolis, which is really, it's the southeast of Galilee. So Jesus goes from northwest, big circle, down southeast, then going back into the land. So again, it's clear just from that. And this is where having a little map would help. And maybe thinking through some of these things that we tend to read and gloss over would help us to understand more of our Lord's mindset. We understand he's trying to spend as much time as possible outside of the land. He's trying to spend as much time as possible away from the people, with his disciples. That's why he doesn't go straight back. He takes the long way around. And yet people continue to come. Multitudes continue to come. And he continues to heal. So he goes the long way around. The capitalist was another Gentile region, a pagan region, a Hellenized Greek region. So again, we have here people that do not know the Lord. Of course, most in Israel do not know the Lord either. But people who do not even claim to worship the true God of the Bible. Pagan people. Heathen people. Now, this is not the first time we've seen the Decapolis in our study of the Lord's life. You may forget, but back in Matthew's Gospel, 
Matthew chapter 4, verse 25, at the beginning of the Galilean ministry, when Jesus is going all around, healing and teaching and preaching the gospel. And we read in Matthew 4, 25, and there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. So again, people from all over the world knew who Jesus was. We're following Jesus to get a piece of Jesus, a glimpse of Jesus, a miracle from Jesus. Very few wanted the gospel of Jesus, but everyone knew who Jesus was. You might also recall back in Mark chapter 5, the first 20 verses, this was the very end of that longest day that we talked about. And the very end of that day where Jesus cast out these incredibly powerful demons out of these two men. And he tells them to go and to tell people what the Lord has done for you, which is very different from what he normally does. Including today, he normally says, don't tell anybody. Because he wants, again, some alone time. But in this case, he tells the people, go and tell them what I've done. And in Mark 5, verse 20, we're told he departed and began to publish in Decapolis. This, at least one of the men who had the demons cast out. He began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. So again, we've seen Decapolis a few times already. We see very clearly that there were people in this region who knew who Jesus was. Again, they all knew who Jesus was who had already experienced the power of God, who already were excited if they knew Jesus would be around to try to see more things and to get more things. And as Matthew's already told us, many multitudes came, many multitudes were healed. And Mark gives us one example now. So verse 32. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they beseech him to put his hand upon him. So one of these great miracle stories, and Matthew's already told us the deaf, the dumb, were healed. And here's an example of that. One of these great miracle stories, one of these tragedies of life, tragedies of sin, tragedies of this fallen world, is this man right here. He was deaf, as a deaf man, he could not speak well. Perhaps he would not be able to speak well anyway, even aside from being deaf. So this is a man who cannot hear. He cannot communicate. This is a man who life is a great struggle for. Life is a great struggle for this man. You know, I was reading yesterday, and to this day, really, we... Though we all like to think of ourselves, and hopefully not we here, but we as people, we all like to think of ourselves as so advanced and so civilized and so cultured and, and so whatever. You know, how often do we maybe look at people like this and maybe think a little bit less of them because we cannot communicate with them? And hopefully we don't, but many do, and that's part of the cruelty of man's nature. And it used to be even worse than that. There were places in the world and groups of people who would kill people like this. They thought they had all sorts of demons. They thought they were something was super wrong with them. They must have been wicked. All sorts of evil they would do because, again, you can't understand the person. You can't communicate with one who is deaf and dumb. And so imagine, and even at that time, this was outside of Israel, but the rabbis taught that, these people must have been really wicked. And of course, we know they taught all sorts of crazy nonsense, those teachers in Israel. And so we can only imagine in the pagan lands, it wasn't any better. And so this life was a real struggle for this guy. Not only could he not communicate and not understand and not be understood, but he was looked down upon probably in incredible ways. And he was a man who was not dumb in the sense that he could not think, he just could not communicate. And he could not understand what others were communicating. And is there anything worse than that? When you think about it, few things are worse than not being understood. And a few things are worse 
than having no one around you who you can really communicate with how you are feeling, what you are thinking. I just finished reading 1984 again, and I've been telling everyone that they need to read that book if they haven't. Really do. And, and it's just uh, one part of that book, though, the main character, he, he says he has the realization that maybe the best thing is to be understood. Even more important than being loved is to be able to be understood. And I thought about this man here. Because here's a man who, while he may have been loved by some, because there are those who took him to Jesus and praise God for them, but he can never be understood before this moment. He can never be understood. And when you think about that, how grateful we need to be that we can be understood. How grateful we should be that we can communicate, that we can hear and speak. These are things that we take for granted probably, and yet there are those who have lived and there are those alive today who would not take that for granted. And may we not take that for granted. And we praise God for our blessings. And we praise God for our physical and spiritual hearing. Just a few verses back, Mark 7, verse 16, Jesus says, If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Talking about his truth, his spiritual truth, which requires both physical hearing and spiritual hearing. And of course, even without physical hearing, God can allow people to have spiritual hearing. But praise God that we have the ability to hear. Praise God for the blessings we have. And where there is a lack in our lives, because there are lack in all of our lives, where there is something that is off, something that is amiss, something that is wrong or hurtful or painful, then we ask God for grace for ourselves and glory for him. I think about what Jesus says of the blind man in John 9, which we'll be at eventually in our study of our Lord's life. In John 9, verse 3, Jesus says the reason why he's blind is that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And if we have a lack in our lives, may we, may we ask God to make his glory known in us, to manifest his works in us, however he sees fit to do. But thank God for the ability to understand. Thank God for the ability to be understood. Thank God for all the blessings we have. And in this case, thank God for those who did love this man enough to bring him to Jesus. And may that be us. May we love people enough to bring them to Jesus. May we love those less fortunate than us enough. Those who struggle more than us in whatever way it may be. May we love them. May we treat them kindly. May we ultimately look to bring them to Jesus because in the end that is all that matters. And so thank God that this man, though life was torturous for him, he had some in his life who cared enough, who knew enough to bring him to Jesus. And may that be us for people in our lives as well. So we have clearly, though, a man who life is a great struggle for. And he's brought to Jesus. And look at verse 33 now. And he took him aside from the multitude. So this is Jesus now. He takes the man aside from the multitude. And there's something so sweet about that. There's something so wonderful about that. That here we have a man who his whole life has probably not been very well thought of by most people. Here we have a man who his whole life has been ostracized has been belittled, has not been cared for the way he should, most likely. And now he's brought to Jesus, and Jesus takes him aside, giving him his full and undivided attention, something this man has probably seldom known in his life, is the full and undivided attention of another human being. 
And here we have Jesus, the great miracle worker, Jesus, the Son of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who gives this man his full and undivided attention. What compassion, what love, what mercy and grace. And you know what? He does the same thing for us too. Jesus does the same thing for us too. Too. Another great story that we'll see eventually in John's Gospel. John chapter 8 this time. The woman caught in adultery. And we read that account. It's a wonderful account. And we look forward to reading it. But eventually it gets to the point where it's just Jesus and her. It's just Jesus and her. And praise God for those times. And praise God in our lives we can have that anytime we want. Just Jesus and us. And thank God that Jesus knows how to take everything else away. The noise, the people, the confusion, the strife, the sin. He knows how to melt it all away where it's just us and Him. He knows how to give us His undivided attention. He's big enough to be giving everyone His undivided attention at once if we would then give Him our undivided attention as well. And so thank God for this compassion, for this grace, this love, this humanity right here. Taking this man aside from everyone else. Just him and Jesus. And thank God for those times in our life. We need those times in our life. And he put his fingers into his ears. And he spit and touched his tongue. And we may wonder, well, what exactly is going on here? Why does Jesus do this? He doesn't do this because he needs to. Obviously, Jesus could just speak the word, which he's going to do here in the next verse, and he's going to be healed. So, so he didn't need to do any of this stuff. So why is he doing this? And, and honestly, we can't say for sure. But one, I think, interesting and maybe even likely possibility is that Jesus is showing this man that he understood. Jesus is saying to this man, I understand, you're not dumb. It's not that you don't have anything to communicate, it's that you cannot communicate. I understand that you cannot hear. And so he sticks his fingers into his ears. And I understand that you cannot speak. And so he touches his tongue. I understand. Maybe no one else has ever understood you. But I do. Maybe no one else has ever given you quite the proper time of day. But I am. And no one else certainly could ever help you. But I can. Praise God for that. And regardless of the reason why Jesus did that, I think that's a, as good as any for us to speculate. The truth remains that Jesus always understands. Jesus always understands us. When other people don't, when we don't even understand what we're trying to say, what we're trying to communicate, what we're trying to pray, Jesus does. Jesus does. And praise God for that. As we said before, few things, maybe nothing is worse than not being understood. Jesus always fully understands. When the world doesn't, when our friends don't, when our family couldn't, and when we can't either, He always understands. I love Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, Verses 26 and 27, really in talking about prayer, we read this, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for us for the saints according to the will of God. How good is that to know? 
Now the Bible tells us Jesus is making intercession for us also. But how good is it to know this too? That the Holy Spirit is praying for us, is interceding on our behalf. And when we don't know how to pray, when we cannot put into words what we're trying to say, maybe we can't even put into thoughts what we're trying to say. And yet Jesus already has for us. And his spirit is already praying for us and already helping us along. Praise God for that. Also, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. What a wonderful passage this is about the Word of God. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. When we can't put into words what we're feeling or thinking, when no one else would understand us, when we cannot even understand us, God always can. And if you go to the Word of God, it's amazing how so much will become clear. I cannot say how many times in my life that has happened where I read the Word of God and suddenly everything else makes sense. Suddenly I can communicate with myself even in a way I could not before. What I was trying to say, what I was trying to think. Why is that? Because the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Because that's how powerful the word of God is. And it continues then. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened. Unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Jesus sees it all. He knows it all. He understands. He understands. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If we have a need, if we have a lack of understanding, if we have a lack of being able to communicate, whatever it is, we can go to the Word of God. We can go boldly to the throne of grace. And we can know that mercy and grace will be waiting for us. Praise God for that. Praise God that Jesus understands. Praise God that Jesus understands. Praise God that Jesus is willing to have everything else dissolve away. And take us apart by himself, by ourselves, to heal, to encourage, to strengthen, to open our understanding anew. Praise God for that. So he took this man aside from everyone else. He stuck his fingers in his ears. He touched his tongue. And then verse 34, and looking up to heaven, he sighed. Looking up to heaven, he sighed. And that was probably another sign right there. Looking up to heaven, because it's God that will heal you. He's communicating to this man. And he sighs because he feels his pain, because he understands. And he wants this man to understand that God and his gracious power will do what needs to be done. And he saith unto him, Et fata, which is likely Aramaic, and it means be open. Be open. He says to this man, be open. May your ears be open. May your tongue be open. May your understanding be open. May your ability to now be understood be open. The power of God's word. Be opened. And straightway, or immediately, his ears 
were open, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plain. Immediately, a true miracle, unlike the frogs and phonies today, a true miracle, something no one could fake, something that happens immediately. Immediately his ears are open. Immediately his tongue is loose. And immediately he begins to speak plainly. There's a few miracles going on there. Not only is this man now able to hear, but he's able to speak. That's a miracle. He didn't need speech therapy. He didn't need anything. Jesus took care of it all immediately. Jesus took care of all of it immediately. That's the power of God. A true miracle. He says, be open, and he was open. An amazing miracle of God's grace. How much more amazing is the miracle of salvation? Because this is exactly what happens at salvation. God says, be open to our hearts and our minds and our eyes to discern spiritual truth, and they are opened. And we are saved, and we are redeemed, and our sin is forgiven because of the power and the grace of Almighty God, because salvation is of the Lord. What an incredible miracle. Obviously, salvation is the greatest miracle. What an incredible miracle here. Be opened, and he's open. And you think about this as someone I saw did. This is a wonderful thing, of course. This is an incredible thing that Jesus does. But negatively speaking, now this man is able to sin with his tongue, whereas he was not before. And you think about that. And how easy it is to sin with our tongue. And how we all, probably every day, sin with our tongue. Because no man yet could control their tongue, as James 3 tells us. If a man could, he'd be a perfect man. Only Jesus did that. This man can now sin with his tongue. And it's worth mentioning, because it again reminds us of the depraved state of of man and the depraved state of this world that as wonderful as this is and as miraculous and as glorious and as truly good as this is it, it is all of that because of this though this man has a whole new world of sin opened up to him and that really is the tragedy of this life and that is the tragedy of this fallen world and of our human nature. That even in good times, even in blessing, even in grace, sin lies at the door. And that is why in the end, we look for and we long for the return of our Lord. And in the end, we praise God that this is not our home. Then we are citizens of heaven, as Philippians 3, verse 20 says. We're just passing through as pilgrims in this wretched world. Called to occupy until our Lord comes. Called to enjoy the blessings he gives. Called to proclaim his gospel. And yet called to hope for his return and to long for heaven. Because even when things are good, it's only a matter of time before things turn evil in this fallen world. And so just something to think about, that even in the midst of this, now a whole new world of sin is open to this man. That's the nature of this fallen world. That's the nature of our depraved hearts apart from God's mercy and God's grace. But Thankfully here, his tongue, his ears, opened. Now he can communicate. Now he can speak plainly. 
And if we could just feel for a moment what this man must have felt and the gratitude he must have felt. Praise God. In verse 36 now, and he charged them. So not only the man, but those who were with him, those who brought him to Jesus. And he charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it. And again, Jesus does this often. And as we said, likely to try and minimize the crowds and always to no avail. Because the crowds keep coming and the people keep speaking. And honestly, it's hard to blame them even. Especially this man who now for the first time can speak plainly. And now you're telling me, I can't even tell anyone what you've done. And so it's hard to blame him for his desire to say what happened and for those who brought him to Jesus to say what happened, of course. And yet that's probably why Jesus says this, because he's trying to get alone. He's trying to get some time. People don't ever give him time. And two, how different Jesus is from us so often, right? We want to proclaim to everyone the good things that we've done. We want everyone to know how great we are. Proverbs 20, verse 6, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find only one will always be faithful, and that's Jesus. And he's the one who most of the time told people not to proclaim the good things he did. So just as a little aside, how different Jesus is from us. But I suppose that's a good thing, because if not, he wouldn't be God, and he wouldn't be the Lord, and he wouldn't be the Savior. But certainly how different he is from us. And we can learn a thing or two about not wanting to proclaim ourselves all the time from Jesus. And then verse 37, and we'll close with this this morning. As they went around publishing this to probably everyone they could think of, people were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. That little statement there, he has done all things well. That is something that is fundamentally true about our God. That he has, he is, and he does do all things well. When you read all the way back in the very first chapter of our Bible, Genesis chapter 1, the creation account. God creating this world, creating the heavens and the earth. And what do we see time and time again in that chapter? That God looked at what he had made and he saw that it was good. Because God does all things well. God only creates good. God only is good. And this is still true of our Lord today. This is still true of our Lord today. He does all things well. His will is good. His plan is good. His promises are good. His work is good. Everything he does is good. Everything he does is well. Psalm 18 verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect. As for God, his way is perfect. He hath done all things well. May that encourage us today. May this account encourage us today. As we said last week, if anything, Jesus is more willing today to heal us to encourage us, to save us, to change us than he was with these people then when he just wanted to get alone. If anything, he's even more willing, and especially if we are his people. And so let us cast our burdens down at Jesus' feet. As these multitudes came and they cast their sick down at his feet, as these folks came and they brought this deaf and dumb man to Jesus. May we cast ourselves down 
at his feet. May we lay our burdens down at his feet. Like the woman of Canaan last week, may we recognize our own unworthiness as we do. May we never think we deserve anything from our Lord, yet in humility and in faith, appealing for a few crumbs of mercy, which he is more than willing to give to his people. May we recognize our own unworthiness. May we rest in his amazing grace. May we revel in his love and compassion. The same love and compassion he had for this man in this situation that he has for us for our circumstances today. And may we praise and proclaim our God. May we praise and proclaim His goodness, because truly He hath done all things well. He hath done all things well. And right now, let's pray. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you once again for another incredible account of your love and your mercy, your compassion, your grace. We thank you, Lord, though it is always undeserved and all will always be unworthy, especially us. Yet we thank you that you are worthy, that you are kind, that you are good. And may we cling to you today. As we said, may we rest in your grace. May we revel in your love and compassion. And may we proclaim your goodness to ourselves and to this world. And may we then continue to experience your goodness and your grace more and more and more. And so we thank you today, Lord God. Help us to praise you today. Help us to love you and your word and each other more today. And to just walk with you as you give us the grace to do so. And so we thank you. We praise you. We pray all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.